Uh, welcome back uh, to the forecasting uh, principles and practice uh, textbook discussion that we have been doing for a couple of months. And we're happy to inform you that we have reached the final chapter, chapter <laughs> 13, <laughs> not to get into the into the superstitious you know, th here. Uh, so in chapter 13, what we're going to do is uh, just revisit some issues that you may encounter in you know, real world uh, cases that the authors are, are uh, warning us, you know, that we should, uh, you know, how, how do we should approach it and also how to, how to solve uh, those situations, okay? So in this chapter, I'm not going to touch all the sections, okay? I'm going to leave that for future cohorts, but at least the selected ones are very interesting and you, you'll see why. So let's start with the first one. Let me put this in high. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, learning objectives. As I told you, uh, we're not going to cover all the sections of this chapter. There are a total of nine. We're only going to cover five. And this is just my you know, personal selection on five topics that you know you should be aware of when we're dealing with uh, uh, forecasting using time series. So the first one is when the periods are weekly, daily, and sub-daily data. When we say so daily data is, let's say, uh, hourly, okay, or five minutes uh, periods, et cetera. So it's less than one day. Then we're going to talk a little bit about ensuring forecast uh, to stay within la limits. And this is when sometimes the forecast fall into the negative uh, uh, numbers area. Uh, we don't usually don't, 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 don't want that. Then I found this very interesting because I've never, you know, heard, heard about it. And it's called, there's a topic about backcasting. So backcasting is the opposite of forecasting. You know, instead of going to the future, we're going to the past. Okay, so that's, that's that, that one, you know, caught, caught my attention. Then uh, a revisit on the forecasting on training and test, and test sets, especially um, mechanisms to avoid uh, overfitting when we are, uh, training the model, right? Like we do in machine learning, uh, you know, in a traditional machine learning uh, model. And the last, not the least, uh, dealing with outliers, uh, abnormal uh, uh, points in the in the series and missing values, which are uh, related the way that we can, uh, you know, we can solve them, all right? Okay, so in the introduction, as I said, the authors uh, give us some practical uh, uh, examples and also practical wisdom <laughs> on their experience dealing with this kind of situations. So the first one uh, that they pose is when we are dealing with a weekly data. And it's interesting that, uh, and, and that you know reminds me of uh, Federica, you know, where she is in Rome, uh, in the Western uh, civilization and Western countries, uh, we use the Julian calendar, right? But the Julian calendar is kind of awkward if you look at in a in a in a mathematical way, because for example, the year is divided into three hundred sixty-five days, which is the rotation of the Earth, you know, around the Sun, you know, going going on the, in the same, you know, get, getting in the same point, right? But that's kind of arbitrary. We could we could call it. 1,000, you know, parent units or whatever. So the problem with the weeks is that the weeks don't fit very well within the frame of the year or even the month, okay? For example, there is some months that have 31 days. There are other months that have three days. And there's one, of course, February, you know, the little one that has uh, 28 days, right? And every four years, we are want you know to complete the you know the the the, the three hundred sixty five point twenty five days. Really, that's the basically the, the the frequency that we have established for the rotation of the Earth 
uh, around the sun. So in the weekly, uh, it poses a challenge because there's not an integer, you know, that can explain that period within a larger, uh, you know, a larger uh, period, like the month, the quarter, or even the year. So the solution that the authors gave us is that to use the STL, the composition that we have, you know, seen previously, I believe it was in chapter three, uh, in combination with a non-seasonal uh, uh, method applied. And the example that they provide us is uh, when we study the this time series, which, which is the, the supply of uh, gasoline products in the US within a weekly, a weekly time frame, uh, you know, weekly uh, production from 1991, February 1991 to May 2005. And the way that we're going to be, the unit that we're going to be using for the gasoline is not gallons, it's really barrels. And in the US, one barrel is equal to 42. Uh, gallons, gallons of, of, of oil. Okay, so you have to make sure that you know you have you know the right, the right, the right conversions. So this one, and uh, I bet it's in the millions, right? In the in the in the millions figure because it's just a, a number, a number with a decimal. Uh, we get this kind of uh, plot, okay, for the time series, which is that there's a high at the beginning of the time series. There is an increasing trend. Then it plateaus, right? Around 2000, you know, let's say 2000, 2001, etc. Then it goes a little bit down and then, you know, it goes a little bit up, but it's also, you know, stabilizes. Okay. So what we do, because we have, we have a weekly period, so we are going to have kind of irregular, uh, uh, you know, uh, seasonality here. Uh, the authors, what they do is that they combine the STL, the seasonal trend level, this the composition uh, a formula. They combine it with a non-seasonal. Uh, in this case, the ETS. And the ETS, to make a non-seasonal, we're going to set the season, uh, you know, uh, lever, the seasonal flag, uh, set it to uh, N, to none. Okay, so that the STL can do the seasonal uh, component. Okay, so in this case, when we apply this method and do the forecast for the next two years, uh, we get this result. Okay, and as you can see, the result is kind of a stable, right? You know, the, the trend is stable, but then you get the up and down, the seasonality that is reflected in the, in the actual uh, time series. Okay. Another approach that you can do, apart from combining the STL with any non-seasonal, also combine it with ARIMA also, is to use the dynamic harmonic regression model that we saw, that we discussed in chapter 10, section five. And in this case, we're going to use precisely ARIMA. We're not going you know, to give any parameters on the, you know, the period, the seasonality and the differencing. And what we're going to do is let the, let the seasonality be carried by a Fourier series. That, that, that's part of the dynamic uh, harmonic regression. Of course, when I say that PDQ is the, the, the capital PDQ, the, the, the lowercase PDQ is still, you know, uh, it's going to be determined by the autorima uh, model here. Okay, it's just the big ones. Okay, so when we apply this again to the two seasons, we get something similar, but the seasonality is a little bit different. If you can see here, the seasonality is more uniform. Okay, here the seasonality changes in this part of the graph. Okay, so it goes down, it goes up, uh, you know, it goes up, it goes down, then to the middle. It stays there and then it goes uh, down. Then it goes up, it goes down to the middle, it stays there and then it goes up. So that's part of the uh, seasonality uh, of indication that the model can capture, all right? So 
in conclusion, uh, we can use this for uh, you know for 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 weekly, uh, for daily also, and also for the uh, sub daily uh, data. In other words, try to combine a seasonal model with a non seasonal, and then you know put it together. Uh, the author also told told uh, tell us that by experience, the dynamic uh, harmonic regression approach is preferable. Okay, especially if you have additional regressors. For example, in the gasoline that, that we're talking about, if we had some indications of the price of oil, okay, uh, that could help, uh, you know, get some information into the system to try to get the forecast a little bit more accurate, okay? That could be a help because the price of crude oil globally could affect uh, the supply of those uh, uh, of that derivative, which is gasoline in this case. Um, any any comments here? No. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh huh. Go ahead, Federica. Uh, all clear so far. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. This is uh this is just like a review. Okay. The only thing that the authors kind of you know, presented some new things that we could uh, we could find in in different scenarios. Okay, so for the daily and so daily data, uh, just a, a reminder, right? That usually you need you know there's going to be some complex seasonality here, especially in the sort of daily data. For example, if you have the electricity output of a, you know of a of a of a of a, of a, of a utility plant, and you have it by hour. But then in the hour, you're going to have a period of 24, right? 24 by day. But also you could have a demand increasing during the weekdays and then decreasing during the weekends. So you will have also weekly seasonality. So it gets a little more complex, the, 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 the problem when you are getting a little bit more granular, that per periodicity compared to the time frames that we're used to. So uh, here, uh, the use of additional regressor, what, it, what we call X-Regs, in other words, other information that is not contained within the time series, okay? Like I mentioned, for example, the price of oil, uh, the, the inflation index, okay? Uh, you know, could, could that help for the gasoline? So some models accept that you can use those X regressors. For example, the ARIMA model, and the profit model that we discussed in chapter 12 accept additional X, X rigs. But for example, ETS do not accept any, any X rigs. So that will kind of constrain if you need those X, X regs, additional regressors for your modeling, that will constrain you know, what are the, you know, the available models that can accept them. And of course, we haven't studied this in this book because this book is more for traditional methods but also you could use uh, machine learning methods. For example, uh, gradient boost, random forest, even you know, linear regression. And we have seen one in chapter seven. So linear regression is a model that accepts multiple uh, uh, predictors. The only thing is that you have, to, uh, you have to engineer the date, the date there, because they want to set the date as, uh, as, as, as a feature. It has to be numeric. So then, you know, what you do is that you extract different features from the date to make sure that that information is contained with, with that model, all right? Okay, so uh, here, there's another problem that is posed by the authors and is ensuring forecasts stay within limits. And I have had that experience in one of my, you know, trainings for, for high performance time series, uh, I had that, that, that situation that sometimes not only the forecast, but also the confidence intervals that go beyond you know, the mean on the forecast, uh, sometimes the lower gets into the negative territory. And usually you don't want that, okay? And there are many ways you know, to solve it. For example, put a floor into that confidence interval, you know, that anything negative, you know, it, sh it should be, it should be uh, translated, it should be equal uh, to zero. 
In this case, the authors use the uh, the price of different, you know, let's say commodities uh, here. And in particular, we're going to be using the price of eggs by year, okay, between uh, starting from 1900 to 1993. Okay, so we can see, you know, how low, okay, those uh, costs have been, have, have been going throughout, you know, throughout the period. So this is the, the time series. And as you can see, the forecast says that eventually the confidence interval is going to be touching zero, right? Which is something that could happen, but you don't want it, you know, to get into the negative territory. And of course, the forecast shouldn't be negative because there has there has to be some price paid uh, for all, all, you know, the eggs or the copper or anything else. So one of the things that they propose here is that we build that this kind of formula using the log uh, to try to constrain the forecast and confidence interval within a range, okay, a predetermined range. In this case, they propose to try to constrain it between 50 and 400, but also it could be between zero, right, and 400 or 300, depending on, you know, the assumptions that we want to, they want to do. So with this formula, what happens is that when you uh, apply it to the, you know, to the model, you know, using what is called the scale uh, logic, okay? And of course, if you do a transformation, remember that to get it to the actual values, you have to do an inverse, right? You know, if, if, you, if you have a log transformation, you have to eventually apply the exponent, a function, to get it to the actual value, because if not, it's going to be only a transform. So here, this formula that I'm pre we're presenting here, we're going to do the formula of the function, but then also the inverse. So we can change it back to the, you know, to the to the actual actual units that we can use. So we applied it to the to the model, okay, using my scale logic to the new transformations. And then we see that now we get a, a, a plateau, right? A plateau within that lower confidence. In other words, that lower confidence is going to never be less than the lower range that we established, which is in this case, which is 50, okay? So uh, be aware of this. This is not the only uh, method to do it, but it's one that you could be using, using a lot of transformation with a defined uh, in, in, in interval, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a priori, okay? All right. Questions so far? Everything good? Yeah. All right. All right. So here in this section, the authors talk about forecast combinations. And what they are proposing is that usually when we are modeling the time series with different algorithms, uh, we usually choose the one that gave, gave us the best you know, value for the metric that we are aiming to. For example, if it was the RMSE, we're going to choose the algorithm with the lower RMSE or the highest uh, R square, okay? So what they're saying is that in practice, you should combine different algorithms and then use an average of the results. What happens is that when you use the average of the results of different algorithms for the same time series, that combination usually has a better performance than each of the individual, individual algorithms or, or models, okay? So in other words, if we use ETS, if we use ARIMA, if we use PROFIT, if we combine them and averaging the, the results, usually, usually not, not guaranteed, but usually that average gives you a better uh, metric than each of the, of the individual ones, okay? And to prove that point, 
Uh, we're going to do the takeaway, uh, takeaway food, uh, a monthly revenue in Australia. Uh, you are going to use that data set uh, from 1982, April 1982 to December 2018. And we're going to apply, this is the, this is the, the, the plot, okay? The time series plot, as you see, is basically monotonic. Your score increases, but it has a, you know, the seasonality associated with it. So we're going to use three models here. We're going to use ETS. We're going to use the ETS combined with the uh, STL decomposition as we did with the weekly uh, uh, data. And then we're going to use ARIMA too. And here in ARIMA, we're going to transform the turnover, okay? The, the values of the, of the revenue the turnover, we're going to transform it with a lot. Okay, so we get the more uniform uh, variance. And then we're going to uh, average those results and then get, get a combination which could be a fourth model. So you have three individual models, but then with a combination of the average of those results, then you have your fourth, fourth uh, model, okay? So here, if we auto plot, all those uh, all those models with the combination, you see that the combination is the one in green. And the one in green, it really does very well following the trend and also seasonality of the actual, actual data. And since the visual, uh, you know, the, the, the visual component could be misleading, then you can use the accuracy uh, function, right? That we have seen, you know, many times, and arrange it by RMSE so that the first model that is uh, that is shown has the least RMSE, and you know, is going to be ordered by that uh, by that metric. So here you see that the combination of those three, just the average, just combining the results of those three models and average it, uh, we get the best RMSE. And all of the other metrics also concur, agree with the with the uh, conclusion that the combination is the best is the best model. All right. Uh, also, you can you can uh, you can see this practice in many uh, in many uh, many other textbooks, uh, not related to time series, but related to machine learning. Uh, usually, they call it stacking. You know, a stacking ensemble, so that we blend different uh, algorithms or the ones that are performing well, we do an average or we stack them or we do a weighted average, et cetera, to try to get the best of those three models, but combined, you know, com com combined, okay? And uh, one of the things that the authors also explain is that uh, what about if, because we're we're just looking at the mean here, you know, the, the, the mean of the of the distribution that the forecast mean. But what about the distribution? Can also the distribution uh, have a better performance? The distributed forecast had a better performance than the individual ones. And to make the story, you know, uh, simple, uh, the conclusion is that it does. Okay, with this Winkler score, okay, we did the whole distribution. One thing that the authors tell us is that that combined model for the distributions, there is no you know, particular function yet uh, in one of the packages you know, to get this. You have to do it kind of manually here, but they did it, okay, with this, uh, you know, with, this, with this script, we get the combined distribution and then we apply this Winkler score, which in chapter five we discussed, it was one of the metrics for trying to assess distribution forecasts, their metric of the distribution compared to others. And in this case, the combination also is the winner with the least uh, score, right? Sorry there, with the least score uh, compared with the individual algorithms. So that's something that is very, uh, is, is very important that in practice, uh, you should, you know, you should be aware that not only you shouldn't choose the, the best algorithm, you should try to combine that algorithm with the other algorithms that you're working 
and probably the combination uh, be a single, you know, single, uh, a single, a simple average or a weighted average. You can weight them if, 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 if it's possible. But the other side, just a simple average will usually get better performance than the individual algorithms. And also in machine learning, the same thing. If you do, uh, you know, five models for, you know, what, what, whatever uh, situation you have, and you choose the best three, and you, you know, average it or, or stack them together, usually you get better performance of that stack ensemble than the individual. And you get a more stable uh, 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 forecast or predictions, okay? Yeah. What what if uh, uh, can can we use another other uh, such as um, the the median, for example? Uh, here uh, they're using the mean because the assumption is that the you know that the uh, the confidence intervals, okay, and the residuals and everything are following a normal distribution, okay. Uh, you could use the median, but that would be non-parametric. In other words, you will have to uh, kind of, you know, tweak the formulas to, to try to use the median. And usually the median, you use it when there is a very skewed, uh, you have reason to believe that the distribution of those, you know, numbers on the forecast is very skewed. And usually it's not, okay? Uh, re remember the central uh, limit theorem. You know, when you're resampling any any distribution, eventually those mean samples they follow a normal distribution, and that's what is happening. Here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, aha, back casting. This was an interesting one. This was a very interesting one, and I said, wait a minute, but. Okay, backcasting is the opposite of forecasting. So forecasting, we're getting an actual, you know, uh, time series, right? The observed values that we we have, and then we're projecting that to the future. Okay, that's that's fair game. But here, what we're doing is instead of, uh, you know, forecasting, we're backcasting. In other words, we're going to the past. And I said, okay, what, what kind of you know real world application this could have? And you know, doing the research because the book doesn't tell us exactly, uh, you know, how, how how it's going to be used. Just that it was something that it was you know uh, proposed or outlined by uh, this person, John B. Robinson, if it's there Water Louis in nineteen ninety. But that doesn't mean that doesn't tell me too much. Okay, unless I dig into you know what 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 was he proposing. So some of the practical applications is in terms of when you are managing limited resources, okay? So the example that the, the, you know, the page that I researched says about backcasting explained is when you're studying uh, road traffic, okay? Projected growth or road traffic within, let's say within a, a, a metropolitan area. Okay, we can we can pick Rome, we can pick Paris, we can pick New York, we can pick Orlando here. Okay, so you will see that usually road traffic, when you try to project the growth, you'll see that there's going to be a tendency to increase, uh, especially if you do it within, let's say, 10 years, 20 years, etc., because you are trying to plan, urban plan for it. So if you're doing the forecasting and you're saying, okay, in the next 10 years, I'm going to have, let's say, 50% of the traffic that I have now. In other words, it's going to basically double. Okay. So, or, or basically, you know, add half of it because that will be 100%. Half, add half of what I have. Let's say I have 10 million vehicles uh, average uh, per, per year in traffic. Let's say that number. So I'm going to have, in the next 10 years, I'm going to have 15 million, okay? So how can I accommodate that, you know, that impact, that growth impact that I know is coming? Well, one thing that we can do as urban planners is 
build more capacity, right? Okay, let's try to build more roads or expand some of the roads that we have, expand them. Maybe they're two lane, let's get a three lane, whatever. Okay, in some cases, for example, I was thinking about uh, your city, uh, Farica in Rome, probably that won't be <laughs> a solution, right? Because you don't have a land for, ex for expansion in that sense in the city, right? <laughs> We, we make it smaller. We divide exactly. Or, or maybe you can you can add a second tier. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but but it's difficult because you know uh, Rome, like you know a, a lot of you know uh, cities that have been populated for a long time, already the land is already you know uh, developed. Okay, there's no surplus. Okay, uh, for example, in, in Orlando, we still you know could go that way. Okay, but. One of the things that we can do then, because maybe that's not the best solution, you know, to, to deal with it, is instead of building more infrastructure, how about if you try to reduce the road traffic? In other words, instead of trying to deal with the forecast of the growth, okay, let's try to see if we can limit that road traffic, you know, to a, to a certain point and then back cast to see what are the things that we need to do in 10 years to make it happen okay it's kind of a if it's kind of a backward thinking you know if you if you if you, if you uh you know you understand it that way it's kind of a backward thinking but it's forward in terms that if you're doing with limited resources probably you need a different kind of solution and that's where back casting really is useful uh take another resource for example water and we have a big issue here in the US, especially in the area of California, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, that's, that's the Southwest a region where right now the water uh, is getting scarce. Uh, you know, the, 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 the river that, that is the main source of water, the Colorado River is not, you know, uh, increasing its capacity. In fact, it's decreasing. The capacity, and and I can testify because I was a couple of years I was in Las Vegas, and um, I saw the the you know the the Hoover Dam. Okay, you see the difference in level between what it was then, let's say ten or twenty years ago, and then what is now, and it's and it's and it's low. Okay, and that is not going to be get replenished. So, so the example that the the author has in case that you need to backcast because of that particular situation of limited resource. In other words, you cannot increase your resource, so you have to deal with what you have. So then we have to make sure that our actions are in conformance with that backcast, so we don't exceed our our limit. So in that case, uh, R he said uh, the author said that R doesn't have built-in functions to do this. But with a little hacks, with some hacks, we can do it. And one of the things that you should be aware of is that there is a reverse uh, function within R, okay? Or within one of the packages. I, haven't, I have not really researched this, but there's a ref <laughs> that reverses the row numbers, okay? In other words, instead of going from one to 10, one to 100, it's going to go 100, 99, 98, 98. And that's what we need. Okay, because then using that hack, then we can project our actual values, but instead from to the future, to the past. Okay, and then try to use that information to try to make sure that we are within the limits of our resource, be road, road, uh, you know, uh, road infrastructure, water infrastructure, uh, etc. Okay. So that that was that was kind of interesting because I never, you know, I have never been acquainted with this. Okay, I don't know if you you Federica have been, uh, you know, have been aware of this. Yeah, mm, no. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, obviously, I've I've heard of it. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a. Um, um it is a way to double uh, uh check the 
forecast uh, right. future um, value. And let me tell you, and let me tell you, one of the things that I have noticed uh, because I've been traveling to you know different European cities. For example, I tried to Barcelona in 2010. Uh, I traveled to Italy in 2000. I think it was 16. I think 16, 17. And one of the things that I noticed, especially in Barcelona, is that there was this push in 2010 to get everyone uh, using uh, pu public bikes, okay, or scooters or whatever. And that tendency really has spread everywhere. Okay, right now in Orlando, if you if you don't have a car, at least you have some options. They're not going to be that, you know, sometimes they're not practical because of the distance, but, uh, you know, you have that option of getting a public bike and going from A to B, okay? From, you know, going to the supermarket because he has a whole bunch of cargo space and all that, you know, to get that. So there was kind of a movement, at least at the beginning of the of the, 20, of the 21st century, to try to accommodate that traffic that instead of using the cars, you have alternative solutions, okay? And now also with, uh, uh, you know, public transportation, uh, Uber, uh, Lyft, and all that, uh, you have choices that maybe you don't have to, you know, use your car just to go, you know, and buy some groceries or, you know, go, go to certain places, okay? So I think that's part of, you know, what, what they're trying to do to try to accommodate the, you know, the services that they, they require with the infrastructure that they have, especially, in, you know, in, in big uh, developed cities. Okay, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> all right, so let's see. Uh, this is not new, but the authors uh, give us, uh, you know, uh, an advice on the the mechanisms that we should use, the good practices that we should do for forecasting time series. And usually what we do is, uh, you know, get a training data, get a test data, and then train train, uh, train the model on the training data and then apply it to the test. Uh, here, they have a, a little more sophisticated way to do it. Um, we're going to do multiple steps forecast for the test data and also one step forecast, okay? In other words, trying to use the test data a little bit more intensive so that we can avoid the overfitting and also, uh, uh, you know, get a better generalized model, okay? So in the multiple step forecast on the training data, we're going to take, again, the take uh, away food uh, data set. We're going to use the real model. And uh, we're going to do the test data as the last five years of observation. So the last five years is going to be our test data and the rest is going to be the training data. So here we are, we have the training, we have the test, uh, we fit our our model using the training data, and then we forecast, okay? But when we are doing the forecast here, we're still using the training data, okay? We're still using that training data, right? Okay? So we defeated a function. Now we can incorporate uh, you know, some information that we get from the training data, but, you know, apply it to the test data, okay? So we get that fitted function for the 12, you know, the 12 periods that we're uh, forecasting. And then using the training data, we're going to plot it, we're going to layer it, and then we're going to uh, get the, you know, uh, the, the forecast, the, the full expenditure forecast. So that's one way to do it, okay? The other way is one step forecast on the test data, which I think is the, is the, is the way, way to go. So the way that we're going to do is that we're going to use the last six observations, right? The five years divided by, uh, multiplied by 12, those are the six observations. So then we're going to use those forecast errors, okay? the forecast errors to try, you know, to, uh, you know, help us uh, define a better uh, forecast for the next, uh, for the next uh, 
uh, period, okay? So we're going to try to do that. And the author says, even though we're using the test data to try to you know, uh, adjust that forecast, we still are not doing any anything wrong with the data leakage, et cetera, because the model is following the train data, the training data, okay? We are just using those errors to adjust, you know, on the test data and then, you know, uh, getting into the future. So the way that they're doing that is with this function, uh, refit, okay? So instead of uh, plotting the train data, doing the forecast and then comparing the forecast with the test, we're going to be using more intensively that test data using the refit test which is the one-step forecast using those uh, forecasting errors. And then calculated the accuracy. And as you can see, uh, let me see if I can have this. I don't know if I have, no, I, I, I didn't calculate it. But one thing that you could do is calculate the RMSC with the fitted model that we did with a multiple uh, step forecast, and then compare it with this one, okay? In this case, with the model, uh, the, the refit model, we get a 20, right? Uh, 20, 20 units of, 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 of our RMSE. Then when we do the accuracy, okay, with the fit, with the fit, uh, which is putting that training uh, model and then compare it to the test, then we get an RMSE of uh, 16, which is a better uh, uh, model than the one that we have before, okay? Uh, this can, you know, can have different methodologies. For example, you can do uh, cross-validation also. Remember that cross-validation in the time series, if you are using the ARIMA model, uh, profit model, which has the traditional time series uh, forecasting, uh, the validation is going to be sequential, okay? So for example, you get, a chunk of the training data, right? A chunk of the training data, let's say uh, from five years, are going to take three years, and then you're going to get a portion of that as the test set data. Then you're going to adjust the training data, incorporate that test data, and then, you know, uh, uh, window it, you know, through different stages of the whole training set, just as we, just as we do in the cross-validation in the traditional model. But we have to maintain that sequence. If we use machine learning methods, for example, uh, random forest, XGBoost, uh, we don't have to do that, okay? But we have to feature a feature engineering that date so that we can get all the all, all, all the parameters of the date uh, in different columns so that then we can use that because we can use the date directly. In ARIMA and PROFIT and ETS, we need to use that you know, component, which is the date, which is give you, gives you the sequence, all right? So that's one thing. I don't think that's this is earth shattering. We have seen it, but there is some nuances uh, to it, to it, especially the refitting uh, part of the, you know, of the of, of, of the of the whole cycle on how to model, and how to use the test data for the one step forecast so we can get a better uh, uh, accuracy on that you know, on, on, that, on those, on those predict, uh, predictive or future values, all right? Okay, so we still have 15 minutes, so I think we're on time. Let me, okay, also uh, check this one. Uh, these are five tips to reduce over and over fitting of forecast models. Remember, uh, forecast models like any model, any machine learning model, is prone to this, to underfitting, overfitting. So you should be aware that there are very various techniques. This is one of them that we discussed, but there are various techniques to try to, you know, make sure that you train and you test data. They are, you know, they agree. They agree on the, on the on their performance. In other words, not one that is way down and all, all, all the one that is, you know, really off off of the charts. Okay. All right. So dealing with uh, missing values and also 
this one we have seen in other you know in other situations but we are going to see it uh, particularly with time series and usually when we plot the time series we can get an idea if a point in the graph is uh, an outlier or not right an outlier which is a, a value that you know is uh, uh, disproportional to the main to the main pattern of the time series. Um, here, we are going to use the tourism, the tourism uh, data set that we have been, you know, doing with the hierarchical. But here, we're going only going to uh, use one time series, which is the visitors of Adelaide Hills region of South Australia. Okay, so when we see this, we see clearly that there is an outlier here, right? Okay, in this point, uh, which is around, let me see, it's an observation around 2002, uh, fourth quarter. Okay, uh, very, very noticeable. So one way that the authors say that we can, we can use to find out liars if they're not that explicit is to use the STL, our famous STL decomposition, and with the argument robust, robust uh, equal true. Any outliers should show up in the remainder series. So when we apply this to the series, we'll see that in the remainder, boop, there goes the outlier. Okay. And also doing the traditional box plot, you know, with the values of the time series, also, we can see that the the the, the extreme value, you know, on, on that point also shows up. Okay. Uh, the author talks about you know doing kind of a stricter rule instead of the box plot, which is the IQR. Okay, you know the IQR is this this range in the in the box, which is the 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 difference between the seventy five percent quantile and the twenty five percent quantile, and then multiply by uh, one point five. All right. So here. Uh, they use kind of a different, you know, kind of a different metric, but using also the, the box plot parameters, okay? And here also, they go to the same conclusion that that, that you know, point is, is an outlier. You know, that there's no way to, to uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to go around it, all right? So the point is, when, when you... Identify an outlier. What do you do? Uh, are, are you go, are you going to dismiss it, you know, as a, as a fluke, for example, or are you going to try to uh, explain explain you know what happened? Because it could it could have many causes. Uh, it could be a valid number. You know, something happened. You know, during that part, for example, remember the. I don't know if you remember that data set from. Uh, airline passengers that we had at the beginning of the chapters that had a range that there were no, you know, there was no traffic, okay? And it was explained that in that range, there was a pilot strike, all right? So now we know that we have a valid cause, you know, to explain those numbers. But again, how do you deal with it, okay? So one of the ways that the authors point out when we cannot explain very well what happened, maybe it could be a data entry, or it could be something that never happens, right? You know, a, a, a bona fide outlier. So one of the things that we can do is treat it as a missing value, okay? So in other words, we are going to impute a, a value, okay, from, you know, the normal pattern of the time series that is going to replace that outlier that we don't have an explanation, a valid explanation. In other words, it's, it, sh it shouldn't have been there, okay? Because if we have a valid explanation, then we have to deal with it. No, no, uh, 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 we, we, can, we cannot be, uh, you know, we cannot be uh, replacing the data for our own, you know, for our, for our, our own opinion. We have to have some valid, uh, some valid motives for that. Okay, so the way 
that the authors uh, explain how to deal with the outlier and the missing values. In other words, we're going to treat the outlier as a missing value. So is by using ARIMA, the real model, not only for the forecast, but also in this case, using it to replace those, those values. In other words, with ARIMA, they're going to have a model that is going to show a uniform pattern for a time series. Well, use that model to then, you know, replace that uh, that invalid, you know, invalid point or points in this case. So this is the the way that the authors, you know, uh, uh, say it, and it's using the tourism. Okay, we're going to filter by the region and the, and the purpose is visiting. Then we're going to uh, already have the outliers, right? The outliers uh, uh, defining, in this case, it's just one only, a, a data set of, of one row. We're going to exclude it from our, our uh, time series, okay? We're going to then fill gaps, which is filling the gaps on the date. So because we're removing that date, we have to fill it again. So I'm going to remove that date, uh, uh, you know, incorporate that date again of the outlier, but then with uh, NAs, all right? And this is going to be the AH miss. Then the AH miss, we're going to model it with the ARIMA, the whole series, when are we doing training or tests or anything, the whole series, then we're going to use the interpolate to impute those missing values impute with interpolation between two points that the ARIMA is going to be uh, uh, giving us, you know, the result of the ARIMA, right? And then we get this data set called AH field, which has the model of ARIMA and also the imputing of the model ARIMA to those missing values, right? Uh, and then if you want only to show the outline periods, we're going to write join with outliers and you know, select, you know, deselect the trips. And this is the imputation that we have. So for the region on the 22nd quarter, the trips model, the impute value is going to be this one. Okay. It's going to be 8.49 for the STL and for the trend is going to be 11. Okay. So when we use AH field with the interpolated uh, values for that particular point, we see that instead of getting a spike, we're getting kind of a line between the preceding point and the following point of that particular observation. Okay, so that's the that that's the, the interpolation, the gap that we're filling there. Uh, understanding that we are treating the outlier as a missing value. In other words, we came to the conclusion that outlier has no explanation, no valid explanation to be there, all right? Okay, so that's basically it. We arrive to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me do the stop.